fourth uh, annual BU Data Science Day. Um, I know it's a little early. Thank you all for those who came on time. I'm sure we have many more people joining us. So uh, let me just start by um, uh, introducing uh, Vice President and uh, Associate Provost for Research, Gloria Waters, uh, to uh, perhaps start us off with some remarks. But before she does that, let me just say how um, it is nice to have somebody like Gloria um, in, in the office. Um, I work with her all the time, and I can tell you that it's a big difference to have somebody like her. She is a huge advocate for data science. Um, she, um, she's really vested in everything we do at the Institute as well as data science, so I, I could not have a better ally in, in the administration. Thank you, Gloria, for everything you do. Thanks, Azar. So um, I'm really delighted to welcome you to this uh, fourth uh, data Science or a BU Data Science Day. I was thinking it was the third, but it's the fourth. I remember the previous two uh, vividly, but I'd forgotten about the very first, which was uh, somewhat smaller, I think. Um, and I, you know, although it's only the fourth year, I think that the BUDS Day is something that has really become an institutional event that researchers anticipate and look forward to attending throughout the year. Um, and I, looking back on those very first days of, uh, of data science and thinking about data science at BU. I think it's really incredible, the momentum that's built up at BU over the past uh, several years <clears throat> in terms of this field. So I think, um, you know, in some ways that's not really surprising because data science is everywhere. Um, science is very data focused. Uh, all science involves data. Engineering uh, is very computational. Uh, technology involves the development of software and those kinds of things. But I don't think it's just a reflection of the fact that data science is everywhere. I think what we're seeing here at BU is really uh, the result of, of something different than that. So several years ago, we decided to invest in the Hariri Institute for Computing. And the idea was that it would catalyze and amplify the faculty's work in computing and data science. And so I think in essence, we viewed Hariri as the engine that would empower not just the core disciplines of computing um, and data science, but really all the disciplines at BU that are involved with computing and data science and that could, be, could leverage uh, work in computing and data science to really catalyze and to really amplify the work that our faculty are doing. And we recently had an external review of the Hariri Institute, which was uh, really very helpful in so many ways. I think it was really helpful because, first of all, um, we had very prestigious outside reviewers here, and they were amazed at the work that is happening at BU and also the work that's happening um, at Hariri. And I think under Auser's leadership, um, the Hariri Institute and the whole area of data science at BU has really uh, way surpassed our aspirations uh, when we first, uh, you know, invested in the Hariri Institute um, about five or six years ago. The cross-section of uh, participants at Bud's Day, I think, really speaks to the impact and reach of data science across the university in almost all disciplines, and it's really a demonstration of the incredible work uh, that the Institute has done in creating this vibrant data science community um, here at BU. So just to say a little bit about how the Hariri Institute has really supported um, the faculty. I think uh, they've been really successful in setting up very unique infrastructures and also resources for the entire community, not just for those um, in data science. And so these are things like BU Sale, which has really had a phenomenal impact on the productivity and the ability of our faculty um, to do work, and also BU Spark, which has been really uh, incredibly important in getting students interested in the field and doing some very, very interesting and important work. So um, I think, you know, in addition to those things which supports the broader community, I think that the Institute has uh, really uh, put forward some very important foundational projects and also applied projects and they've worked on topics like data privacy, information security, cloud community, com cloud computing, and digital health. I mean, lots of lots of different areas that cut across all the areas at BU. So I think, you know, today uh, funding for academic research is uh, something that we worry about a lot. 
And I think we've seen that having something like the Hurry Institute, having something like the Data Science Initiative here at BU is really something that we can leverage to um, actually make our research um, much better than it would be without um, having those connections. So it's really nice to see the wide range of people and fac faculty and areas and things that participate um, in the BU Data Science Day. So I'm delighted that it's been as successful as it has been and that it um, is continuing on. So I think in a certain way, this is just a celebration of the strengths that we have at BU um, in data science and how it's all connected here and also of the potential to do even more. So uh, something like this takes a lot of work um, for those who organize it. And every year, I think, uh, you know, the committee in involves a new group of faculty. So uh, Lei Guao this year, uh, Assistant Professor in College of Communication and Emerging Studies is one of the organizers. Eva Maria Terzi from uh, Computer Science in the College of Arts and Sciences and Vijaya Kolakoma uh, in School of Medicine and Computational um, Biomedicine. And then the Hurry staff play a really important role, uh, especially Catherine D'Angelo, uh, who has been very involved in organizing this. Many thanks to her. Um, and then I have to also say, this wouldn't happen without Osser's uh, incredible leadership. And so we're all uh, incredibly grateful to him for organizing us all around data science here at BU. So thanks. Thank you, Gloria. Um, so I want to say a few words about data science. And uh, recently, uh, been thinking is what is data science? Is that a discipline? What is data science? So I have a couple of uh, comments to make first. Um, you know, data science, you can think of it as data as a qualifier for science. But if you think about it, what science is not based on data? So pretty much every science is a data science. Well, maybe we mean the science of data, but that sort of is missing something, the, the, the science of data X you know, whatever that X is, science of data analysis, science of data processing, data mining, learning from data. These are all fields on their own, right? So to me, I think data science is really not about a specific discipline. It's really about that transformative trend that's across all disciplines. It's sort of like the catalyst for interdisciplinarity, um, the, what I like to call interdisciplinary glue. So, um, just a few days ago, I bumped into this article. It says, there will be no data science job titles by 2029. Well, that's a little discouraging, all this excitement about data science, and there are no jobs in data science. Of course, that's not what they mean. Uh, actually, today, if you go and look at what jobs are data science, I have them in the back there. I don't intend for you to read them. But there's like hundreds, and they don't have the words data science. It's all about analytics, and about AI, and about clouds, and all that. So, so I think it is important to, to understand that data science is, is really a, a glue. It's not itself. There's, you, know, you cannot point your finger to it. Um, so taking that, if you look at BU looking ahead, um, this is a quote from President Brown's uh, letter and in a way challenge to the community uh, to think ahead. What would BU look like? Um, the most integrated major research university in the country that seamlessly connects programs and people across schools and colleges to create innovative programs and contribute to the solution of challenges facing society. So you can see why now data science is important, because if there is a way to, to do that, to integrate all these disciplines, data science is one of the tools you have. Data science is the language that allows all these disciplines to work together. So. Um, I just want to start you off with this. Today, as you'll see, the program is really about data science as this catalyst enabler. Um, so we'll see it through. Um, and the BU Data Science Day, as Gloria mentioned, this is the fourth uh, one. Well, this is to us, it's the tip of the iceberg. This is, this is the celebration of data science at BU. But data science activities uh, at the Harry Institute and elsewhere, there is a ton of it. Uh, and it happens literally weekly and daily. So I, I want you to make sure you, this is not just a one event you come to, connect with us. Um, what do we do? 
three things I want to talk about them. First one is this idea of serendipity. We want people to meet each other to see what they can come up with. So we are, that's what we do. A lot of the things we do day in and day out are these events and so on. Um, the second thing is we have this re research incubation uh, awards program where we want to fund people who come together for the first time to do collaborations. Um, has been very successful and we continue to do it. The call for, for the research uh, incubation awards should be coming out in, in a few weeks. And then finally, a lot of initiatives that are started and we invite you to connect with anyone and all of them. Uh, and uh, so, so with that, let me just say that please use this opportunity to connect more with us. And at this point, I'd like to welcome uh, our uh, co-chairs for BU Data Science 2019. They have worked so hard on this, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the time they've put in it. Um, so with that, uh, Legao, uh, Vijaya, and Evi Maria. Evi Maria cannot come until 10 o'clock because of childcare uh, responsibilities, uh, but she will be here later. So uh, Vijaya and Lee. Thank you very much, everyone. Very welcome. Uh, my name is Lei Guo, and I am Assistant Professor of Emerging Media Studies at College of Communication. Um, I'm also a junior scholar fellow with the Harari Institute. So let us, uh, just to give you an idea about what we are going to do um, today. So as Gloria and, okay. Yeah, okay, so as Gloria and the Azure mentioned that throughout BU campus, uh, we have a great number of faculty and students who are working on the data science methodologies. And we also have a lot of people who are working on the application of the data science tools. So on the one hand, we have data problems, and on the other, we have data hammers. So one of the goals of this year's Data Science Day is to facilitate this kind of collaboration between researchers who are working on data problems and researchers who are working on data hammers that can potentially solve the data problems. So for our very first panel of the day, we would like to showcase that. So this kind of collaboration is already happening at BU campus, and they're already generating some impact. So for the first panel, we will have three pairs of researchers who are working on methodologies and applications, and they already collaborated and have some successful outcomes, so they are going to share with us some of their, of their experience and their um, thoughts. And our second panel, we will have a group of researchers who are also working on different data problems and data hammers, and they are working on data of different modalities like images, text, social networks, and many of them are new to BU campus, and they also look forward to creating new collaborations. And then we'll have panel three, so research enablers. So we have invited a lot of people from different BU units and organizations. They cr provide critical resources and support that facilitate, that enable data science research. So we will have people from the BU library, from IRB, from the Harari Institute, IT Center. So you'll learn a lot from those people. And, and then our panel four, uh, we are going to come back to the origin of data science. So we have uh, four very great experts who are working on the core of data science uh, methodologies. So they are going to tell us a bit about the theories that make things to work. And I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, Vajaya, to uh, talk about other parts of the program. Good morning. Uh, welcome to all. Uh, thank you, Azur, Catherine. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about the other four special sessions uh, uh, that we have today. Uh, as Azur mentioned, one of the main goals is to basically bring people together, uh, make sure we have new connections, and in fact, strengthen existing connections. So the first talk immediately after panel two, sorry, the first session immediately after panel two is this fa faculty lightning talks. We have about 10 faculty who have generously agreed to give lightning talks for a minute or two to introduce their work. It's almost like a one-slide presentation. It's actually cool. And we are requesting uh, 
them to talk about their work. And then at the end of that session, we have a special tables that we have arranged. If you look behind, you'll see uh, the same uh, faculty with their name plates on the tables. And we are requesting people who are interested to work with these faculty to really sit around and then talk and engage. And the goal, again, is to basically meet new people, establish new connections, and then take data science forward. And then we have this, uh, after immediately after lunch session, we have uh, the uh, provost talking about the uh, strategic initiative that's happening at the university-wide level, followed by two faculty who are going to talk about some strategic aspects. Uh, uh, Margaret Batke is here, and as I'm going to talk about it. And at the end, we have the special student session, which is about posters. Uh, we have about, I don't know, 30 or 40 posters that were submitted, and about 10 of them were selected, and they got some awards. And they're going to present uh, quickly again with one slide for what they have done. And we have also posters outside, and they I mean, people who are interested in their work can also see what they've done in, in the posters. Thank you. So let's get started. Okay. So um, our very first panel of the day, again, we want to showcase that um, this cross-disciplinary collaboration between people working on data hammers, data problems, are already happening. So in this panel, we have three pairs of researchers. Uh, each pair consists of one data scientist and one researcher whose specialty area is not necessarily data science, but they are applying data science methodologies to their domain areas, like communication research, like medical science. So we have, uh, let me invite my panelist, maybe move to um, this table. So um, we have the first pair, Margaret Becky and myself. I am a communication researcher, and Margaret is a, a computer scientist. And our second panel will be Yanis Paskalidis, a professor of electrical uh, and computer engineering, and Bill Adams, professor of pediatrics and the clinical research informatics. And our third panel, we will have Mayak Varia, research associate professor of computer science, and Jared Dennis, associate professor of pharmacology and medicine. So the format of the panel will be like this. So each pair of speakers will spend about 12 minutes talking about their research, their collaboration, so you'll have a basic idea about what we ha they have been doing. And then we will spend the second half of the panel to have our, all of our panelists to discuss their collaboration experience as a group. And we are also going to take questions from the audience to uh, let our audience to learn more about the um, impact, impactful collaborations. All right, so let's start it. So first, it will be me again. So let me invite my uh, collaborator, Margaret, to join me in telling you a little bit about our collaboration. All right, so again, I am a communication scholar and my collaborator, Margaret, a computer scientist. So let's just give you an idea about each of uh, our uh, specialty area. So um, my work is mainly about media effects. So I was a journalist, so I'm always interested in learning whether traditional media like New York Times, CNN, and a new media like Facebook, Twitter, whether they have any impact on public opinion whether they can change the public opinion in different issues. So for example, some of my recent studies involved the diffusion of fake news um, during the 2016 presidential election. I've also recently studied whether Twitter will reinforce the echo chamber problem or the political polarization. So for our research, in order to understand media coverage and a public opinion, we usually use method, something that we call manual content analysis. So we will train human coders mostly often students, to have them manually go through every single news article and decide things like sentiment, themes of the article. So in the old days, the method was okay because we were talking about maybe hundreds, thousands of news articles, but in this new digital era, we are talking about tons of media outlets. We are talking about millions or even billions of tweets, and our traditional method just cannot handle this big data set. That's why I turn to um, methodologies, tools in data science. That's why I turn to uh, collaborate with people like Margaret. So, 
All right, so my uh, research interests are in image and video computing, in artificial intelligence and applied machine learning. And so um, I picked uh, pictures from a bunch of different projects. Uh, it's convenient in my research, I can visualize what we're doing. So you can see some bats flying out of a cave there and uh, from three different cameras, we were able to film them and reconstruct their 3D flight paths so that we can do behavior analysis. Um, I also uh, work with people in uh, physical therapy, and so the idea there is you have um, devices like robot arms or um, interfaces like the Kinect, which has depth and color cameras, and you analyze what people are doing, how people are moving. We're also looking at faces and facial expressions to see if we can help uh, a math tutor work better, if we can find out somebody is very frustrated. Um, and my work is also in basic AI or basic image and video computing where we're looking at a deep neural networks and we're, we're trying to understand what, what nodes, which noise modes are firing for what type of input and can we use that to um, characterize patterns and images um, you, in, in that example that I'm showing there, you see, you see a, uh, a very complex image with lots of content and then another one, a nice lake or beach and very peaceful. Uh, so uh, the interactions are uh, typically with people who have image content. And so I think Lena is going to talk about how on earth we got together because most of her work, at least initially, was, uh, was on text and not on images. So we actually met through the Harari Institute, and we continued the conversation on one year's Bio Data Science Day. So I think at that time we decided, I think I was very excited about market work. I think you also were excited about my work, and we were like, we wanted to collaborate with each other. And then uh, we launched this research group, Artificial Intelligence Emerging Media AIM Research Group. Uh, one thing uh, to work on projects that at the intersection of on communication research and data science. So one thing I would like to know that is that we got some seed grants from the Harvard Institute that actually really got our research started. And then and that leads to like a bigger grants like those from the Google Research and from National Science Foundation. So today we are going to just give you a very brief introduction about some of our current projects. So a big thing that we are working on right now is to use data science tools to detect media frames in gun violence coverage. So as we all know that the issue of gun violence has been, become very serious in this country. And then as a communication scholar, I really want to know whether the exposure of media coverage may have some impact in changing the public support about like maybe gun policies. And the first step, we have to understand how the news media cover gun violence issues, how the news media frame gun violence issues. So just a, a very briefly about media framing. So um, the idea is that in order to cover any news uh, event, so it is not possible for reporters to cover every aspect of the reality. So very often they select certain parts of the reality and make it prominent to the public's mind. So I think this image illustrates this media framing idea very well by highlighting one side of the picture. Actually, the reporters are telling very different stories. So about gun violence coverage, so we found that news articles are actually talking about this issue from many different perspectives on many different frames. So for example, some gun violence coverage will talk about the gun control aspect of the issue. Some news coverage actually blame individuals, uh, saying that the mental health, the mental illness, is actually the biggest problem, while other news articles focus on the pol political side of the debate, framing it as a political debate from the two, pol uh, from the two political parties. So in our project, we are trying to use machine learning to uh, predict media frames in news coverage. Um, but as far as we know, the most of the machine learning work actually focus on the text. They use the annotations, text annotations from human coders to predict text in the rest of the data. But we found that in terms of the news coverage, the images uh, can also tell us something about media framing. So that's actually the expertise uh, of Margaret. So for example, here I have prepared some images uh, that showcase different frames of the coverage. 
So our model is to combine expertise in natural language processing and computer vision to combine text and images to predict frames in media coverage. So maybe Margaret, you can talk a little bit more. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, we are combining um, deep Latin networks uh, that um, produce um, patterns. So, so we're, we're learning features and then we're using them and combining them from the neural, net, the neural network that takes care of the language to the neural network that takes care of the image. And, uh, and then we um, are hoping that they reinforce each other and that they support us in determining which frame we are looking at. So uh, this is something that, that is sort of ongoing research, so uh, we just wanted to share the ideas um, rather than some of the details um, or results yet. Yeah. And then do you want? And then very briefly about some of our other ongoing projects. So one pr approach that's very popular in computer science is crowdsourcing. So the idea is that instead of having one or two human coders go through all the text, like tweets, news articles, so the approach actually send the tasks to numerous internet workers through platforms like Amazon's Mechanical Turk and Figure 8. So this is approach that's very popular in computer science, but has not been applied to our field of communication research. So the goal of this project, we wanted to compare the performance of crowdsourcing and performance of uh, student coders to see whether crowdsourcing can be an alternative or even a better tool for annotating news articles. So here I have an example of tweet. So basically in our field, we will train student coders to read every tweet to determine the sentiment toward each candidate. But the idea of crowdsourcing is that have a number of crowd workers, like seven workers, to uh, read the tweets independently and decide the sentiment independently. And we aggregate the decisions, like say, at least four out of seven workers decide it is a positive tweet, then we will determine this is a positive tweet. So our results actually show that crowdsourcing is more accurate is uh, more, um, it's definitely cheaper, more uh, definitely more efficient than the traditional method, but it's more expensive. Actually, we will have a student who is going to talk about um, this project in detail in her um, poster session later today. And very briefly about our other project. Yeah, so we developed a greedy algorithm that helps us determine how many crowd workers we actually <coughs> want to employ for uh, a specific data point. So instead of just sending everything out and uh, getting the um, labels from seven crowd workers, uh, we could also send them out and trust one or two or three crowd workers if it's easy to label. Uh, and <coughs> if you read the two tweets, I think you would agree that the first one is just recapping a campaign rally. It's, it's a neutral uh, sentiment, while the other one is actually kind of hard to figure out. Is this person positive or negative about uh, um, in this case, Trump. So we've applied this also to uh, other fields, like uh, uh, labeling cells, m marking the outline of um, muscle cells and stem cells in uh, microscopy imaging. And so the algorithm is general uh, and can be uh, used for applied machine learning. So the idea is once we have this, use the scheme of optimized uh, crowd labeling of training data, then we can create uh, large sets of training data relatively inexpensively and then use them to train our automated um, systems for uh, machine learning so that we can analyze tweets or cells automatically in, in much, much larger numbers. All right, so um, for computer scientists, um, what we have is we, we, um, we usually have these toy problems. They're like these den benchmark data sets. And they're good to have because that way people in the community uh, develop <coughs> methods, uh, algorithms, or neural network architectures and beat these ben benchmarks. But then sometimes you wonder, are they really solving a problem we care about? And uh, is this something that is, is just way too basic research and not really helping in anything or maybe leading the basic research in the wrong direction? And so um, for us, it's actually really important to work with p 
people from the application area, and, and in this case, communication researchers, because they can help us expand the scope of our research and make our research actually relevant and looking at important problems. Yes, just a few words about on how data science tools help with communication research. It definitely expands the scope. Like previously, I could only maybe analyze a select few of media organizations, but now I can understand the media coverage from a wide spectrum of media outlets and also makes my work much more efficient. For example, uh, the crowdsourcing tool that I mentioned. So for the same task, it takes me two months to train coders to complete the coding, but when using the um, computer, uh, using the crowdsourcing tool, it takes two hours and achieve the same accuracy. So I, I really enjoy this collaboration. But of course, we have, met, have encountered a lot of difficulties and challenges, but we are going to save that to our um, panel <coughs> discussion later. All right, so thank you very much. So now let us turn to our second pair of speakers. We have Bill Adams, a physician, and Yanis Paskelidis, a data scientist. They have been working together to use big data to prevent, uh, to reduce preventable hospitalizations and cut healthcare cost. Please. Okay, so let me just uh, say that uh, we are grateful for being here and for having this opportunity to present some of the work that we have done together with, uh, with Bill. Um, so I'll start by uh, giving you some motivation. Okay, so I'll fix this. Uh, <clears throat> so, the slides have been somewhat uh, perturbed because the original was in PDF. Um, so anyway, we'll go with this. So I'll give you some motivation for the work that we are doing. We are interested in problems that relate to the healthcare system, uh, what I would call actually big problems. Uh, the US healthcare system is known to be very expensive is also known to be unfortunately highly ineffective, especially compared with other developed nations. There is a, an emphasis on treatment after a condition appears and not so much on prevention. And our motivation is to improve care, reducing big bucks that are being spent uh, using big data and using related uh, techniques. So an outline of what we plan to present so Bill will uh, give you an idea where the data we are using are coming from, uh, and then I'll present what we do with uh, the data. And finally, I have a slide with some uh, academic, at least, metrics of, uh, of impact of this work. Great, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I sort of want to introduce you to some phenomenal resources that we have across on the other side of the city that you may not have heard of and uh, give you a little bit of background uh, for the data sources that Giannis is um, using for his project. So uh, our group, the Boston Medical Center Health Net System, which is what it's called now, is really a collaboration between community health centers and a large hospital, safety net hospital. So we are deeply committed to the underserved population of Boston. We have a unique population and a fairly unique set of problems. 
Um, we combine tertiary health care at the, at the hospital uh, with primary care at the community health centers scattered all across Boston. And you can see from this picture that we really are deeply committed to a population health framework where we try to capture uh, as much about the health of individuals living in this part of Boston as we possibly can. Uh, the Boston Health Net is the name for this collaboration. We're the largest safety net hospital in New England, meaning we take care of the poorest patients um, and traditionally uninsured patients, although that's less of an issue in Massachusetts. Um, we have uh, 14 or 15 community health centers in our network that collaborate with us. And we have data that goes really back to 1996. So um, just about uh, over 20 years of data from the hospital and a little less than that for the health center. So we have a phenomenal collection of data. And a lot of my work has been uh, integrating the data from the various systems that we've used as we've moved along the health IT continuum. Uh, most recently, we're all on the EPIC EHR, if you know about that. Uh, but we have two different EPIC EHRs, one for the community health centers and one for BMC. Um, through some of our work, we're able to actually look at um, the health of people by where they live. So we GIS code where people live, and we're able to study both what happens to them in the healthcare system, but also where they live. And in looking at this, you can see where our patients come from, which is pretty much uh, the center of Boston, and it's the population that the health centers serve. Uh, the data system that Giannis has been using and the system that we really want to promote uh, and encourage folks over on this campus to be using more and more is, uh, is a database we call the Massachusetts Health Disparities Repository. It was started about 10 years ago. Uh, and what we use is the I2B2, the informatics for integrating biology with the bedside data architecture. So this is open source software. Um, it actually came out of the Mass General Research Patient Data Repository. And it's widely used within the translational research um, institutions in the United States and abroad. Um, it's a very simple database, but it's not a simple process to get all this crazy health data into this format. But it's a simple star data schema. So we have demographic data, we have insurance data, we have the services and places where people go, we have the medicines they're prescribed, the problems and diagnoses they receive, their labs, and more recently, we're putting a heavy push into Create, uh, collecting more and more granular data from the EHR that focuses on behavioral health screenings, social determinants of health, markers for poverty, and, and weaving that into our architecture so we can study um, how those things drive health and health care. Um, we do a lot of work centrally to create a master patient index that links patient, all the, all the data for an individual patient across the network and all these disparate systems. We do a lot of cleaning, and most importantly, we link our data to standard ontologies like uh, Moink and CPT and RxNorm, these national uh, standards that allow us to ask the same questions at BMC as we ask at other institutions that use I2B2, so this standards-based mapping process. And we serve up the data um, either in, uh, uh, through an aggregate query tool, which is not governed by the IRB, or through direct access to our limited data sets. So these are de-identified data sets that we can provide to Giannis um, through a remote desktop environment pretty much over at the medical campus. You know, dealing and organizing, we'll probably talk more about that at the discussion period. Um, health data is sensitive, and there's uh, quite a number of considerations that you have to think through before you actually um, use this data, but it's a solvable problem. And then just to talk about a little bit what's in there, um, three EHRs, four administrative um, kind of scheduling systems, Lab data, most recently, we're putting claims data into the system and going back, you know, now over 20 years. Um, we have about 1.4 million people, uh, 1.8 billion facts, soon to probably double in size with the addition of these um, granular flow sheet data things from the EHR. Um, and, uh, and also, just to whet your appetite, we also use I2B2 to link to 26 other I2B2 instances all across the country, and more recently, um, if you look at the bottom, we're moving towards this Odyssey data model, which is the same exact data, but in a more usable data um, fr format. And there's a lot of really interesting work nationally around using the Odyssey data framework to um, do predictions and a lot of health services type research. So any discoveries or approaches that are discovered here using either I2B2 or soon Odyssey could easily lead to collaborations all across the country because other people are using the same data structure and schema and mapping tools that we're using. So there's really a ton of potential. So now for the serious stuff, I'll pitch it back to Giannis, uh, where he can talk about some of the work he's been doing. Okay.
Okay, so uh, I have a slide where I just want to give you uh, a very brief introduction into the hammer, and then I'll get into some of the results. So we are interested in actually using the data and learning from uh, this data. So first, making short predictions about the future. So one can think about every patient as being characterized by a vector of features, and then there is a certain outcome, and uh, I'll talk later about what these outcomes may be. So we are interested in learning a certain function that uh, maps the input, the patient characteristics into the output and make a prediction. And in machine learning, what people do is called empirical risk minimization. So you collect lots of data that we get from, uh, from Bill, and then you are optimizing the model that you have, the specific function over the training set. So essentially, you use uh, some uniform probability distribution over the, the training set, an average over the training set. So we are actually have been uh, motivated by these problems into developing a different approach than what has traditionally been done. The main motivation is that in the medical data, there are lots of outliers. They are missing variables. They are things that have input it in the wrong way. And we don't want the model to be influenced by these types of outliers. So we have developed an approach that we call a robust learning approach. And the idea is that rather than trusting the training data uh, through, let's say, an average over the training data, we are considering a family of potential versions of the training data characterized by a family of probability distributions and we are solving the learning problem by optimizing the model over the worst case uh, of these probability distributions over the training data. There are ways in which we can introduce nonlinearities into the model that I'll talk a little bit more about. And uh, more recently, one of the, our main focuses uh, and objectives has been not only to predict future outcomes, but also to make specific recommendations for treatment and for other actions that can improve future outcomes. So I'll give you a snapshot of some of the problems that we have worked on, some of the applications. So our very early work looked at uh, some of the important chronic diseases that make up uh, a very significant part of the cost that uh, is being, of the dollars that are being spent in the healthcare system. Uh, so one is uh, heart-related diseases. We collected a data set uh, that had about 45,000 patients from BMC, and then using some of the methods that I briefly outlined, we came up with predictions about hospitalization. So we are interested in predicting uh, whether these patients, given the current status of their health record, will be hospitalized within, let's say, a year from the time we examine the record. And what we found was that the methods that we have developed can do much better than some of the more traditional approaches. So for instance, one point of comparison there's another major BU program is the Framingham Heart Study that has developed a risk factor for cardiovascular disease that essentially the idea was ask the experts what are the important features we should be looking at in terms of predicting uh, cardiovascular disease. If you look at just those features, you have relatively poor quality in terms of the prediction uh, ability 50, 60 percent accuracies where if you use the entirety of the health record, you can have much stronger predictions with an accuracy of more than 80 percent in terms of predicting future hospitalizations. It is also interesting that uh, the algorithm is able to discover specific clusters of disease and is using for each one of these clusters different variables in order to make the prediction. The algorithm did not go to medical school like Bill and his colleagues, yet is able to distinguish without knowing anything that you know, uh, should treat ischemic heart disease differently than heart failure, should treat dysrhythmias different than these other 
major modes of, uh, of heart disease. <clears throat> and in this business, uh, especially working with medical data, providing an outcome that is interpretable is actually very important because otherwise physicians don't trust us, don't trust black boxes and won't actually use it. So uh, another uh, application was uh, using data from general surgery. They are uh, a BMC data set that I'm going to present some results about this now. And there's also a national data set that we've worked. The objective is to predict patients that uh, have been admitted in the hospital undergo general surgery and you are interested in predicting whether they will be readmitted within 30 days. Why 30 days? Because now there are financial penalties uh, on the hospitals for having a higher 30-day readmission rate than the national average, and this costs uh, quite a lot of, of money to the hospitals. Uh, so again, using the data and using a lot of details about what happened during the journey of the person uh, in the hospital, we are able to predict with fairly high accuracy is 80 plus percent whether a patient will be readmitted within 30 days or not. And that, of course, is information that can be used in order to prevent those types of readmissions. So on uh, a more recent uh, project, we have been interested in moving from predictions to prescriptions, if you want to call them. Uh, so we looked at, again, two important chronic diseases, diabetes and uh, hypertension, and uh, we designed an algorithm that learns from the existing data, learns from what physicians do, and uh, tries to use that information in order to come up with smarter recommendations about classes of medications that could be provided, different actions that could be taken, and uh, here we are comparing our approach uh, and the impact that we predict it will have in some of the important variables. So one of the variables for diabetes, it's hemoglobin A1C. Uh, a variable for hypertension is uh, systolic blood pressure. Given uh, this work, we are predicting that if one uses these recommendations, then you can reduce by close to 1% A1C compared with standard of care that would reduce future uh, A1C by 0.2%. And a similar result, uh, more significant reductions in future systolic blood pressure compared to, again, the standard of care. So I think we are moving into uh, a setting where in addition to predictions about what the future is going to look like, we can also make specific recommendations that then physicians can filter with their own intuition and make better decisions, better treatment decisions. So in this final slide, uh, I collected uh, uh, some uh, summary of outcomes of this collaboration. It has been an amazing collaboration for us. Getting access to this type of data has been uh, uh, wonderful, and I would like to thank Bill and his team. Uh, so we met, I believe, six years ago in one of these BU initiatives that brings the two campuses together. And I think this is some evidence that these types of initiatives actually sometimes uh, work and produce outcomes. So out of this work, there have been uh, there are four current PhD students that are working on uh, these types of problems. There have been three PhD students that have been graduated. These are publications that uh, we have related to this work. We have received some internal support from DSI, the Digital Health Initiative, CTSI, which is the Clinical Translational Science Institute at uh, BMC that Bill is affiliated with that is getting support from NIH and for the, from the Center for Information and Systems Engineering. So these are relatively small uh, money, uh, if you think about resources. These have led to about 2.3 million in externally funded projects. There are two NSF projects, uh, one that actually uh, recently ended, um, and 
uh, in the fall, I submitted a final report for that project, and I got a very nice email from the program manager. I'm sad to see this golden oldie go away. We are sad to see it too, but there is a new one that has just started. Uh, and also some support from Philips and uh, from Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's a cliche, but it truly takes a village. So these are people that uh, have contributed significantly to this work. So the first two lines are students, past and current students that have worked on this. And uh, these uh, three last lines are collaborators from uh, the various medical facilities, uh, from uh, uh, PWH, BMC, and also from uh, MGH. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to talk about our work. Um, I'm a cancer molecular biologist, and this is sort of my entree to this problem, which is um, there's a, a lot of concern at uh, National Cancer Institute about emerging cancer cohorts, not only uh, in the United States, but in India. Uh, in particular, uh, breast cancer is on the rise rapidly uh, in the urban setting in India. Um, and you can see some data here on uh, different Indian cities. And so the National Cancer Institute I reached out to our partners um, in the um, health uh, ministry in India to begin sort of collaborative partnerships and think about these emerging cohorts and how can we begin to uh, address this problem. Um, and in fact, um, there's some, uh, some data that's emerging that suggests that uh, in populations both in the United States and in India, that comorbid metabolic conditions, particularly type 2 diabetes or hypertension, many of these um, comorbid conditions that actually uh, Giannis and Bill were talking about in the Boston Medical Center population are also rising uh, in Indian adults. And you can see some data here at the bottom showing for Asian Indians uh, and whites what the relative differences are um, in metabolic disease uh, as a function of their um, body weight or BMI. So um, our first entree to this problem was to look at some of the inflammatory cytokines or the markers of inflammation in blood of patients both uh, in Boston uh, and in Bangalore uh, in India to think about kind of what sort of clusters of inflammation might be important uh, for their metabolic disease. And so we looked at both diabetics and non-diabetics in the two cities and profiled these blood analytes or cytokines uh, in patients. Um, many of these markers here shown on the left are important uh, in breast cancer uh, uh, migration or invasion or metastasis. So we developed um, this, these profiles using these antibody capture kits both with patients from Boston Medical Center and patients in India. So each row here is a cytokine or an analyte, and each column is a patient. And when we cluster these, uh, these kinds of data, um, the redder, redder colors here represent higher levels of expression, and blue represents somewhat lower levels. Um, and we performed the sort of heat map analysis, where it's a clustering of people and analytes, we found a really interesting pattern. One was this pattern of inflammation found in patients at Boston Medical Center and also patients at cancer hospitals in Bangalore, and you can see that on the upper left. And there was another pattern that was found only in Indian adults in Bangalore, and we would only have seen this pattern if we had actually combined the two data sets. So looking at them separately wouldn't have allowed us to see this pattern. We thought that this was very provocative. Maybe there's something here that we could think about if we combine the two kinds of cancer populations. So this led us to a scientific question, which is, I think we need to really partner with our collaborators in different cities to think about different populations and maybe by using principal components analysis, try to decide 
what's both shared and what's different, what's the granularity of these kinds of disease patterns in the two populations. So um, we've been thinking about both breast cancer and head and neck cancer uh, in both the United States and in India and thinking about Americans. Uh, so typically our Boston Medical Center patients tend to be uh, somewhat obese uh, and have hypertension and diabetes, typically Latina or African American women and uh, a very diverse population, also Caucasians. But in India, people tend to be lean and diabetic. So are these the same kinds of patients or are they different? So it, there's a strong rationale to, ca to actually combine and perform the analyses. Um, so we've uh, been developing this platform to think about how we could com actually combine those data sets. So what kinds of data would you want to ask? Well, we can think about among these patients, what are their survival characteristics? Uh, do they respond to treatment the same way? Are there genetic markers that are the same or different between the populations? Uh, what kinds of metabolic diseases are seen and what's the progression? And I showed you some inflammatory data, but we could ask much deeper questions about sort of how do we profile inflammation in these two populations? And we could query different cancer types, not just breast, but colon or head and neck or lung and in different cities and interactions of all of these kinds of variables. So we began by building a team, both with patients and investigators at Boston Medical Center here, but also collaborators at um, Sloan Kettering in New York, where the population there is typically wealthier, healthier, and white. Uh, and then with interesting other populations in Mumbai, where people are typically maybe seen in safety net hospitals or urban poor hospitals, but also <coughs> private hospitals, so Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, and um, the Mazumdar Cancer Hospital and uh, uh, other cancer hospitals in the Bangalore area. And so these are existing collaborative relationships among investigators with clear separate data sets housed in separate institutions. But as I already showed you, there's a strong rationale to combine them and begin to do pooled data analyses. So how does one do this both with different institutions domestically but internationally? And so I approached the computer science department here at BU and said, this is a tough problem. How do we do this in a way that uses protected health information? How do we use seriously, you know, the, this is confidential data. How do we get hospitals to trust each other and investigators to trust each other, but also not violate any laws and not violate any international agreements about data sharing? Um, and so that's how I ended up meeting uh, Mayank. And so we ended up uh, in a pretty interesting conversation about how, how do we solve this problem. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mayank Veria. I'll describe in a second what it is that, uh, that I do. Uh, but just to continue on the thread that Gerald said, what, what we want to do in order to help uh, uh, from a computer science level to help solve uh, Gerald's question is to figure out what is the right way for uh, the researchers in the hospitals, both in the US and in India, to figure out how to uh, uh, analyze the data that they, they both have uh, together. Uh, there are existing platforms, many, many platforms within the, the, the healthcare community for uh, uh, providing, uh, for storing data and for providing access to data. Here's just a couple, uh, but like within a single institution, like if there are multiple researchers within Boston University that want to share data, they could use a system like REDCap uh, uh, or they could use, uh, if they have, uh, so the first, if they have protected health data, uh, the second, if they have de-identified data that is not protected by regulations such as HIPAA, then they could use systems like Google Docs or any other kind of sharing platform. Uh, if you need to share protected health information and if you need to share it across institutions, you would have to use a system like the first one. Uh, and it, there is a complicated uh, structure for sort of uh, IRB approval for sharing information between uh, different institutions, different universities, or different hospitals. Um, but in a sense, this uh, this idea of sort of sharing the raw data between different institutions was kind of not the problem that uh, that Gerald and, and and everybody here wanted to solve. What they wanted to solve was to do the joint analysis over the data held uh, across the different institutions. Right? They want to generate the heat map uh, to understand how their diseases, uh, how the diseases manifest themselves across uh, national boundaries. Uh, they don't want to necessarily share their data in order to do that. Um, so really what we would want is a system 
uh, for sort of storing data that is secure, whatever this means, uh, and is sort of co connected and harmonized between different sites, between uh, researchers in both the United States and India, uh, that, it, that sort of protects the sensitive information stored at both, uh, both American patients uh, and Indian patients. And this question of how to protect this information is really important, uh, especially because, as I understand it, India does not have a regulation comparable to the, the HIPAA, the regulation in the United States that covers healthcare information. And somewhat paradoxically, that means that people in India are very concerned about um, whenever there's a system for sharing information, they're very concerned about making sure it protects people's information because they don't have some kind of obvious checklist kind of thing that if they satisfy it, they know that they're uh, compliant with regulations. So they're very, very uh, uh, risk averse in this sense. So this brings me to what I actually do. So I'm a cryptographer. Uh, and cryptography is about protecting uh, the privacy and integrity of data uh, at rest uh, and in transit and in use. Uh, and the first two of these you probably have seen and used in your daily life. Uh, protecting data at rest is something that like your modern smartphones do so that uh, they encrypt information stored on your device so that if somehow somebody steals your phone, uh, you might be out some money because you have to go buy a new phone, but at least you're not out some data. So the data on your phone is protected so that the phone is effectively a paperweight for the person who, who stole it. Uh, protecting information at transit is that lock thing that you see on your browser when you go connect to a website like Amazon so that nobody knows you know, whatever secret uh, sensitive information it, that it is that you're transacting with. With them, like maybe that you know you're telling Amazon that you're secretly a Taylor Swift fan and you don't want anyone else to know, right? But the the thing that we want to that I want to talk about in this talk is the third piece: this uh, how to protect data even while it's in use, even while you're computing over it. Uh, and this is a collaboration between me and Azar Bastavros and Andre Lapitz and most of the folks uh, within the Software Application and Innovation Lab. And I'll echo what Gloria said before: uh, sale is great. If you're working on something and, and and you need help with software, you should you should talk with them. Uh, the work that I'm about to describe, uh, we have a bunch of of, uh, software packages, they're all open source, uh, so I can chat with you more later about the, the details of them if, these, if this uh, is something that you might want to use in your own work. So the, the problem that we want to solve uh, is how to protect data even while you're using it, uh, even while you're doing some kind of joint aggregate analysis over the data. Uh, so before, without this kind of cryptographic system that I'm about to describe, the usual way that when you have multiple researchers or multiple hospitals and they want to share information in order to do some sort of joint analysis is usually one of the hospitals just gives their data to the other one, or they both give their data to some trusted third party, some trusted arbiter, who would hold on to the data and do whatever kind of sophisticated data analysis over it that, that the folks wanted, and to produce this results. Uh, but what we want to do here using cryptography is to sort of, I don't know, apply some kind of whiteout to the data so that uh, the data never actually leaves the, 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 the original hospitals that, that have it, or at least never leaves it in any form that anybody else can make sense of it. So it's sort of completely de-identified as soon as it leaves the, the hospital. And yet somehow this sort of you know, giant morass that we call the cloud and pretend it's the solution to the world's problems, uh, that it will somehow help us to compute the answer to whatever uh, medical uh, query that we want, such as producing the heat map that uh, Gerald showed near the beginning of the talk. Uh, so I'll first describe what I want to put in this uh, cloud box, and then I'll talk about the, the question of what, what de-identification means. Uh, so the, the piece that, uh, that we want to put into this, uh, this little question mark uh, and the hammer, to use Lay's word, is uh, a cryptographic system called C Secure Multiparty Computation, or MPC for short. And the punchline of the way that it, how it works is that rather than the hospitals sharing their information with one trusted third party, they will share it with two or three or more trusted parties. OK, this sounds worse, right? If you didn't want to send your information to one place, why are you sending it to multiple places? Uh, and the answer is that they won't actually share their information itself. They will share some kind of encoding of the information that if you receive one of these encodings, it is somehow completely useless to you. You can't make any sense of it. Uh, and yet, somehow, so the, the folks here in this middle, in this green uh, dotted box, uh, they will not see any of the hospital's data. They will not even see any information that will allow them to infer even a single record of the hospital's data. And yet, this encoding, even though it makes no sense, it looks like uh, just some gobbledygook, uh, it still is of the format that it will allow these folks in the green box together uh, to calculate the, the result of the computation, to calculate something like a heat map. So they can uh, compute over data that they cannot see. 
Uh, and so from the perspective of the, the hospitals, the hospitals get the benefit of having uh, some kind of data analysis performed over their data, but they also get the security benefit of knowing that their data still remains siloed, that uh, the data in any recognizable form has never left uh, their hospital. OK, uh, and so this calculation, in principle, in theory, you can do this for any kind of, sec uh, you can do this secure multi-party computation idea for any kind of data analysis that you can envision, at least in principle. Uh, in practice, the performance of this is it's slower than doing the data calculation over raw data in the clear if you had it, um, but, uh, but and, and the details of exactly how much that performance overhead is is kind of subtle and complicated. So if you're interested, I can chat about that more with you later. Um, but it can, in principle, allow you to calculate over any information uh, that you want, uh, but it doesn't somehow protect you. It's, not, uh, it's, it's a hammer to make sure that you protect the act of computing the answer. It does not somehow automatically bless the answer as something that's safe to reveal. So if you want to do a query over uh, a bunch of hospitals' information, and that query is release all of Myonk's uh, protected health information, then MPC would do that, right? Uh, but so, so we shouldn't allow such a calculation to be performed in the first place with or without a secure method of doing the calculation. So really what we want is to combine this, uh, combine this idea of secure multi-party computation, which protects the act of computing an answer, with some other mechanism uh, that allows us to de-identify the thing that comes out of it to make sure that it is sufficiently decoupled from any individual's protected health data. Uh, and there are a variety of de-identification methods out there in the literature. Uh, I'll highlight one called differential privacy, uh, which is a, a, a rigorous method of, of ensuring uh, that uh, the result of, an inf of information is provably unlinked to any individual uh, input data. Uh, this is an idea that was developed about a dozen years ago by uh, a BU professor, Adam Smith, and his colleagues. Uh, and it's used widely today. It's, uh, going to be used, for instance, in the 2020 decennial census that all of us will participate in in, in two years' time, in one year time. Uh, OK, so we can de-identify data before revealing it. So if we have de-identification tactics, if we can make sure that uh, we, we sort of scrub information of any individual uh, contribution, then in a sense, maybe there's a question of why we need secure multi-party computation in the first place. And I want to argue that this, uh, this, these two technologies dovetail very nicely together uh, because one of them makes sure that the data is sufficiently scrubbed of individual uh, contributions, and the other one protects the act of computing an interesting answer. Uh, and by combining them together, we can do a calculation that innately involves uh, individual health records, individual uh, information, such as doing some sort of join over protected health characteristics of hospitals in the United States and hospitals in India. For instance, looking for common genetic markers at an individual record basis, which you could never do if you had scrubbed the data before uh, doing a joint calculation. But if you first uh, do this uh, cryptographically protecting the data while computing over it, uh, you can see under sort of the envelope of this secure computation, uh, under the hood, the calculation can actually do this correlation at an individual record level and learn interesting characteristics uh, and then de-identify only the results of that calculation before revealing it out to the world. Whereas if you somehow de-identified information at the individual hospital level before giving it to even a trusted third party in the clear, that trusted third party would have already de-identified information. It may not have the necessary markers or characteristics necessary to perform the kind of uh, uh, data science calculation that you wanted. Um, furthermore, uh, with this uh, sort of envelope, when we have this hammer of, of secure multi-party computation, we can also use it uh, to even figure out whether we have uh, sufficiently interesting data to correlate in the first place. So if you know one hospital in, if, if there are a bunch of hospitals in the United States and India that want to do some sharing, and maybe there's somebody who's uh, trying to be a free rider and doesn't have any information that they actually want to contribute, or their information doesn't actually correlate with anybody else else's data, uh, then you could, you could do uh, any kind of anomaly detection or outlier detection or any kind of uh, metric that you want to assess the fidelity of information before even making your own data available for correlation with somebody else. So if you notice, you know, hey, this data set that you're offering, it doesn't provide me any value, then you could just do some sort of binary calculation to figure out, uh, you know, that there is no interesting value here. We might as well not even continue with this analysis. So that sort of uh, makes sure that you're only computing metrics that are of interest. You can you know, eliminate outliers if that's necessary. You can even uh, short circuit a calculation 
situation entirely if you realize this isn't the right question to be asking. Uh, so using this technology, we can help. Uh, we're, we're working together with uh, Gerald and his team we, uh, to try to integrate this idea of secure multi-party computation with uh, their work. This is ongoing work. It's funded uh, by a joint uh, grant from uh, the Hariri Institute together with the Digital, uh, the Digital Health Initiative. So thank you. Thank you so much for all of our panelists for sharing your research and your story. So I think we have about um, 15 minutes for a panel discussion. So we are uh, we are happy to take questions from our audience. But let me get started. So we all share a lot of the great things of the collaboration. Let me ask you. So of course uh, there are times that things did not work, right? There are times that we're frustrated and uh, we have challenges. So. Tell us something about some, some, what are the things that did not work? Or in retrospect, what would you do differently? Any challenges, frustrations in the collaboration? Maybe I can start. So I, I think the way um, you're describing it is so negative that we actually <laughs> all don't have anything to say. Because we so, want to, we, we yeah, hope so our audience, I think it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's more like, um, Maybe, maybe some issues that we overcame <laughs> rather than problems or difficulties. So one, one thing is when you work with people in very different areas is they speak a different language. And so it's very important to be sensitive to that and learn their language and their tools. And, um, and, and it can go to something as simple as like, how do you write papers and what what uh, software do you use? So you know, computer scientists, mathematicians love LaTeX and and all these equations, and that's why we had a switch here of computers with Yanis having uh, having a very different type of way of describing the work. That, um, and and so. Uh, and then with Lei, she uses Word, and there's all these annotations we can do there, and that's kind of not something we're used to. But there's new new ways now. There's like Overleaf that that uh, we do together, and and so there's um, opportunities uh, also in the technology to help with the collaboration. Okay. So I think one of the challenges, I would say, have been uh, getting easy access to, to the data. And you know, we understand why these are medical data, very sensitive. And now we have in place a fairly elaborate system to get access to the data. We cannot bring the data here to the BU campus. So what we ended up doing is actually installing a server uh, behind the BMC firewall so that we can get access to the data. So getting through that process and uh, uh, converging and having a way of uh, actually being able to access the data and do work uh, has been challenging, I think, for, for both sides. Uh, we are sort of more eager, say, why can we get the data and uh, do the work? And, and of course, and uh, understandably, they are uh, more cautious uh, because what happens if these data find their way out in the open? Um, uh, so, so I think you know work like uh, uh, Maya described w could be useful in the future for making these types of collaborations, getting access to sensitive data more, more and more important. So I, I would agree with that. I think some simple, relatively modest investments in infrastructure could make this type of work much, much easier. And um, I also think that BMC has gone through uh, a lot of uh, maturation in their thinking about how to share data and how to use data. Uh, the, the other big area gets back to this idea of communication. And I always thought I was pretty good at math, but I lost it when calculus went into three dimensions, right? <laughs> and so you guys are all laughing at that. But the clinical stuff, um, I just live and breathe it every day. And so we really are speaking two different languages, and there are no simple ways, and we're all really busy, too, to get each other up to speed. Like if I could take Algorithm for Dummies, and they could take EHR you know, uh, 101, so they would understand more about the data, we would be much more productive. And I think there's some real opportunities there to bring uh, people to closer together from the start of these projects now that we have some preliminary experience. 
I would say that one thing that I've really enjoyed is learning a lot of computational, just the whole literature and multi-party computation and cryptography has been really interesting. I knew nothing about it before I started working with Mayank and his team. There's been one practical challenge, which is that our partners in India are 10 and a half hours ahead. So that means early days or late days for us are trying to just logistically get ourselves talking to each other. But that's a problem with an international partnership. But it's also kind of a perk. Thank you. I actually have a long list of questions, but I want to make sure that our audience um, have the opportunity to ask questions. Yes, please. Uh, so, Bill and Giannis. Um, so, my question is, we're looking at like AUCs for framing hammer score versus, you know, the, the black box, let's call it. Um, but is that a fair comparison if the black box was trained on some subset of I2B2, if I understood that correctly, whereas Framingham was, which, you know, covers lots of health net hospitals in Massachusetts, whereas Framingham was trained in Framingham. Was there any sort of update to Framingham, you know, to like tweak the coefficients to match the population being, say, maybe more African American than the original Framingham, you know, so was that part of the analysis is, was that my, is my question. Yeah, uh, so I think the key difference is not uh, coming uh, in, in accuracy, it's not coming so far from the fact that uh, have been trained on different cohorts. The key difference is that uh, Framingham is using for computing this risk only a relatively small number of variables, six, seven variables. And this is what intuition or medical intuition over many years has suggested are important variables. And these variables have to do with cardiovascular health. So blood pressure, BMI, uh, cholesterol levels, and so on. Uh, where we are using lots of information about utilization of the system. So diagnosis, uh, visits to the hospital. And, and I think the message is that if you can leverage this information, obviously a human cannot, right? And it's hard initially to develop an intuition as to why this variable that somehow becomes important is important. Uh, but, you know, the beauty of the algorithms is that it allows you to use all of this information. And, uh, and that, uh, as uh, it appears, significantly increases the, the accuracy of, of the method. So knowing that you have been in the ER a few times in the last year is not reflected in the Framingham risk score, but is reflected in our computation. And, uh, and that is, uh, appears to be quite important. All right, any other question from the audience? Just in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, I, I know, you know, you guys speak different languages when you're collaborating with each other, but were there difficulty in setting expectations of what, um, what the collaboration is going to bring? to each of the parties in the collaboration? And how, how did you, you know, overcome that, those challenges, if there were any? So I, can, I can start, at least for us. Um, I actually, OK, my answer is more or less no. But uh, I, I think one of the things that you know, computer science is good at is the idea of modularity, right? So it's figuring out sort of how to scope the, where your problem begins and ends. And I think that kind of scoping is important at the beginning of a project. But uh, you know, at least for our project, because uh, you know we were trying to figure out you know how to protect the act of doing a calculation in some sense quasi independent of what the calculation is, right? And Gerald and his group is trying to figure out what are the interesting calculations to perform, what are the interesting data science questions if you have access to you know medical data between uh, patients across countries, uh, independent of how to do it. Uh, I think that sort of a clearly marked delineation is very useful in these kinds of projects. At least that's what our experience was. So I, I agree the modularity is really important. And I feel that um, the seed grants really help. Because if you, if you know you have you know, $10,000 or $20,000, and, and, and then you, um, you know how much time you can put into it, or if you can fund a student to work with it, 
and then you can you can you can also sit down and write something for like two pages and and really specify what you want to do with that money for what time and and what the outcome should be and and because it's so small and modular um, those expectations can be met even if there are all these problems initially and then if things are really good then you can go for a larger grant so in in the project with uh, Lay and and myself we we also had um, a small seed grant and now we have um, a million dollar grant so so the expectations are much easier to meet and even set and describe if you have seed money I, I think for us the team at BU may be over uh, uh, their, their expectations of what they'd be able to do with the data in terms of actually impacting clinical care were um, a little bit expansive. Uh, I think we'll get there eventually, but the idea was we'll develop these actionable discoveries and we'll implement them and test them in actual clinical care to show that they work. And it's a beautiful vision. It just takes more time than four years to get there. And so um, I think a lot of these collaborations, you don't know what you know until you know it. And now we know it, and we're moving to the next step, and it's tantalizing. But um, I think people underappreciate how frustrating it can be to change clinical systems that are well ensconced. Um, is that fair to say, Giannis? Yes. <laughs> and if I, I, I'll add something else. So if we were thinking about this more in a, sort of an industrial corporate setting, where you start with uh, perhaps a set of expectations, you scope what are the resources that you need, the challenges you will face, and so on, and then set goals with timelines, we will never have done what we have done. Uh, I think in an academic setting, and having actually these types of places where people meet, like Hariri and other centers, this is extremely important. You just meet people, you get excited about the opportunities and the work, and you just don't think very hard, and you just move ahead. And you know, sometimes uh, something good happens at the end. So um, one common problem with clinical data is that um, often when there's no data, or the clinician or nurse doesn't know what to enter in a clinical form, uh, the person will sometimes enter 99 in the field. Um, and uh, if you're a computer scientist, it doesn't make sense when you see suddenly all the patients are 100 years old. This doesn't, why, what's happening here? And so it's in the conversation between the clinicians or the data scientists that you realize, oh, we have to think further about what we're actually analyzing here because it has some meaning or maybe there's a shorthand that we haven't actually captured. If you're a data scientist looking at data just agnostically, you don't know necessarily that some of it might be meaningless or uh, misleading. So the conversation between the teams is actually really important as you kind of move the project forward. All right, so I think we have two minutes left. So let me wrap up the session by having each of our panelists let me say one sentence of you know suggestions or advice for our audience because I think many of our audience members are really excited. They probably want to start uh, this cross-disciplinary collaboration. Just a few words, uh, suggestion for our audience. Maybe start with okay. Bill. So I'll just remind everyone that the CTSI, the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, and the Harari are working on uh, better collaborations. But reach out to any of us if you're interested in building that up. Um, and uh, really, we're committed to try to focus on making this easier and more accessible. And I think this experience will help with that. Uh, I would just tell you. Um, be open and go for it and let your creative spirits flow and communicate and talk to people and uh, really fun, good things can happen. I think it's important not to be intimidated by what you don't know. I think Margaret uh, stole uh, my <laughs> thought. <laughs> uh, so I will also say that uh, coming back to the thought I, I had earlier that you know, it's important to seed this type of activities with relatively small resources so that people can at least explore. And uh, I think many times these sort of uh, seeding efforts lead to, to bigger things, lead at least to some preliminary work that they can then take outside uh, and lead to uh, bigger opportunities and resources. 
Uh, I guess I'll just say that I think there are challenges with like cross-disciplinary collaboration, like the language thing we discussed earlier, sort of as an internal thing, and also externally to convince you know funders and program committees that this work is something that at the intersection of two disciplines makes enough progress in your own individual discipline. Uh, there are challenges, but I think the payoff is that it's a lot more fun to learn about other things in the world, and I think it's worth it, so I would encourage people to pursue it. All right, thank you so much again for our wonderful panelists. So we'll, we'll take about 15 minute break and we'll come back in um, 1045. So before, before we take the break, I just want to go back to a slide which I didn't show and I know that Keith is probably gonna not like the fact that I didn't do that. Um, so we want you to tweet. So, and we have a, 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 a Twitter um, handle. I'll just put it up here. Here we go. So please tweet hash buds 2019.